Uh, we have to talk about what happened this week. Uh, before we get to China, because last week you told us we were going to get to China. But first, what happened this week? We got the numbers in on CPI. We got retail sales numbers. And they tended to indicate that maybe inflation is not quite so bad. And then we heard from Chair Powell, and he got up and said he, his mind doesn't change. Was your mind changed? As you looked at these numbers, do you think maybe we're a little better shaped than we thought we were? Yeah, look, I think we are in better shape uh, than I thought we were. Uh, but I think Powell is, the chairman, is in about the right place. He's recognizing that we can't forecast the economy with precision. He's recognizing that it would be a terrible error if we were to fail to stop inflation in this episode. He's rejecting the talk about this being a moment to change the uh, inflation target, and he's maintaining uh, substantial uh, flexibility with uh, respect to the future. I think that is broadly uh, the right place for him to be. Uh, but I think we've got a very difficult uh, challenge ahead of us, because I think the old adage about things taking longer to happen than you think they will and then they happen faster than you thought they could, is really operating with respect to the forecasted uh, recession. It does look like it's pushed back a bit in time, but there are reasons to think, and this is what makes the chairman's job so hard, that the economy could have a kind of Wiley e. Coyote uh, moment, that recession-induced low earnings could pop into focus for stock market investors with adverse consequences for the market, that consumers could deplete their hoard of post-COVID uh, savings, that there's growing reason to think that many businesses are holding on to workers because in this labor-short economy, they're afraid that if they, if they fire them or they let them go, they won't be able to replace them. If that last thing is true, then it could all of a sudden change very dramatically if labor markets start uh, to loosen. So I think the broad picture is where it was. I, I've been gratified to see the ways in which the Fed has uh, caught up, but they've got very challenging uh, judgments uh, to make uh, going forward. And I think they're in broadly the right place. The last thing, though, I, I would say is, you know, everybody is getting enormously excited about whether the dot plot is calling for two increases from here or three increases uh, from here. The, this is kind of the narcissism of small differences. Compared to a year ago or a year and a half ago, when the debate was three percentage points, 300 basis points off of where, it, where things have turned out to be, we're now in a much narrower consensus around uh, judgments. And we need to appreciate uh, that. And it will be great if uh, the Fed turns out to be highly skillful but frankly, with everything going on in the world, this is a case where, as Lincoln said, uh, we really want luck uh, in our generals and luck in our uh, leaders, because this could go a lot of different ways. Uh, Larry, you promised last week we would get to China this week. So let's talk about China. Last week, we saw the COVID zero policy sort of changing. This week, we're starting to see at least anecdotally some of the consequences of that. There are reports, actually, that a lot of China is shutting down. Some people are saying Beijing is like a ghost town. So what potential effect does that have on the rest of us, on the U.S. economy, on the global economy? What should our response be? It's extraordinary the way mandatory lockdowns are now giving way to voluntary lockdowns, with people staying home more than uh, they were a few weeks ago uh, in China. I think it's going to be a very challenging six weeks um, ahead of us uh, in China. And it will be fascinating to see 
what that means for uh, social stability, what kind of political ramifications uh, that has, and it's likely to be a very painful period uh, for China. Two things for us uh, to remember in the United States. First, even if this works out very badly in China, at the end of the day, the Chinese fatality rate from COVID will have been half of what it was in the United States. And so we need to resist any strong tendency to be to feeling highly superior uh, here. Second, uh, precisely because this is burning so out of control, my guess is that it's likely, like the fastest burning fires, to burn out more quickly rather than more slowly. Hmm. And so I think, ironically, a consequence of this is probably to lead to some upwards revision on Chinese economic forecasts beginning next spring. Hmm. And that's a factor tilting a little bit towards higher commodity prices and a little bit more inflationary pressure globally. But that's a highly uncertain uh, judgment. And of course, how all this plays in a broader social sense in China will be very, very important. Larry, last week you brought a longer view with respect to chat GBT that uh, artificial intelligence, I will call it phenomenon right now. But this week we have yet another development, and that is fusion, where in that Lawrence Livermore lab out in Northern California, they actually managed to have a fusion reaction where, as I understand it, they got more energy out than they put into it. So last week when you were talking about AI, you said that had the potential to be as significant perhaps as fire or the wheel. Where does this rank? I think uh, not remotely comparable, uh, David, and of course I might well turn out to be wrong. Here's why. There's a fundamental difference between innovations that give mankind the capacity to do things they've never been able to do before, on the one hand, that's what AI is, and innovations that give mankind the ability to do what we've done before forever cheaper. That's what fusion potentially uh, is. And the first, like fire and the wheel, are much more fundamental than the second. So I'm gratified by the second, but my read is that we've got a long, long way to go before this is available at uh, scale. And uh, that the reports uh, yesterday, reports this week, actually reminded me of all the stories you can read in the 1950s when the first nuclear or fission, fission uh, nuclear reactors were being built about how energy was going to no longer be metered because it was going to be so cheap to uh, produce. And it turned out that that didn't really work because there were capital costs, there were transmission, there were all kinds of things. My suspicion is that this is both less fundamental than something like AI or quantum computing and that it is ultimately uh, going to prove to be uh, quite a long way uh, off. But the only thing that's harder than forecasting inflation and unemployment <laughs> is forecasting the long run of uh, technology. So I sure hope it plays out to be even better uh, than that. Kudos to the researchers involved. And it certainly does bear out something we've said on this show, that if we ultimately succeed with respect to climate change, it's more likely to be because we find ways to produce clean energy cheap than it is because we uh, make uh, carbon extremely expensive.